The road to building a practical airplane started in a place so desolate that Orville said trying to find Wilbur was like searching for a lost Arctic explorer. The brothers chose Kitty Hawk on the advice of the U.S. Weather Bureau because of its steady winds for gliding and sandy slopes for landing. Kitty Hawk in 1900 was the edge of the earth. It, it truly was. It was. It was isolated and barren, and the people had a very hard and, uh, and rugged life. They made their living either from the sea or they made it from commercial hunting, and both of those very dangerous occupations. So it was a, it was a hard place for the people, and they were fascinated with, with, with the Wright brothers. Wilbur had been staying in the home of the local postmaster. Now armed with the tent and provisions Orville had brought from Dayton, the brothers set up camp in the middle of a sand dune and began testing their glider. It had two revolutionary control features, the wing warping mechanism to raise or lower the rear edge of the wing and a forward elevator to pitch the nose up or down. Wilbur and Orville hoped to spend many hours in the air. But the glider could barely lift a man off the ground. For most of that fall, the brothers flew it as a kite and were relieved that their control mechanism seemed to work. The following year, 1901, Wilbur and Orville designed a new glider with much bigger wings, which according to their calculations would solve the lift problem. But that was the year when everything went wrong. It began with the weather. Torrential rains, followed by a plague of mosquitoes. When the wind stopped, the mosquitoes came out. And the mosquitoes in there are voracious. They're, they're, uh, they're huge, and they're many. And they would come, and he said they would darken the sky. They're literally that thick. Catherine, there was no escape. The sand and grass and trees and hills and everything were covered with them. They chewed us right through our underwear and socks. Lumps began swelling all over my body like hen's eggs. Orville. The glider's larger wings did generate more lift than before, enough to carry Wilbur on short hops down the dunes, but still nowhere near what they had predicted. And now that they were gliding more, they discovered a major flaw in the control system. He attempted to make a turn. When that happened, he started slipping sideways. When he started moving sideways, he may have panicked, I know I would have in a similar situation, but he overcompensated. And rather than increasing his control, he lost complete control of the glider. He slammed into the earth, just straight down, the same way Otto Lilienthal had been killed, straight into the earth. He lost his grip, slid forward, and hit his forehead against the back of a strut, and split his forehead open. At this point, Wilbur admitted believing that men would not fly for 50 more years, and the brothers went back to Dayton early. Catherine was delighted to see them, but remarked in a letter to her father, the boys walked in unexpectedly on Thursday. They haven't had much to say about flying. Soon after their return, Wilbur was invited by Octave Chanute to address the Western Society of Engineers in Chicago. Preparing the speech was just the shot in the arm the brothers needed. It gave them a chance to review their work. Wilbur told Chanute what he and Orville had long suspected, that Otto Lilienthal's data that they had been using to design wings was flawed. Even Chanute, perhaps, thought at the time that it was perhaps a bit bold for two bicycle makers from Dayton, Ohio, to question the lift tables that had been produced by the great Lilienthal and published by the great Chanute, not to put too fine a point on it. The brothers certainly didn't feel that way. Back in the bike shop, Orville built a wind tunnel to test wing shapes to see which one produced the greatest lift. Lift is, in order for a plane to fly, you have to get more pressure on the bottom of the wing than you get on the top of the wing. That's what holds it up in the air. And so, obviously, this gets into the question of, uh, it's very important as to how your wing is shaped and at what angle you present it to the air and so on. And these are the things, then, that they were, uh, that they were learning from their wind tunnel experiments. And you see, it was Orville's idea, and this, this was, a, what a great leap of imagination this is. 
that a wing doesn't have to be full size to find out whether it works. We don't have to jump off a hill and risk our lives. A tiny metal wing in proportion will act like a hundred foot wing. It doesn't matter. Inside the wind tunnel, the brothers placed ingenious test instruments which measured the performance of the different wing shapes. Wilbur and Orville methodically recorded the results and produced reliable aerodynamic data. The Wright brothers are literally models of sort of the engineering method. Things have to mesh as you move forward. There's a lot of feedback. Uh, you never leave anything unsolved behind you. They weren't college graduate engineers, but at the same time, they were two of the best engineers working in the world at the time. Along with their ongoing work in the bicycle shop, the brothers feverishly began designing a new glider. Father, the flying machine is in process now. Will spins the sewing machine around by the hour while Orv squats around marking the places to sew. There is no place in the house to live, but I'll be lonesome enough by this time next week. Catherine. In August 1902, the Wright brothers made their third trip to Kitty Hawk. Wilbur wrote, we fitted up our living arrangements much more comfortably than last year. Our kitchen is immensely improved, and then we have made beds on the second floor and now sleep aloft. The main thing, though, is our new machine. Their wind tunnel experiments had finally paid off. But the puzzle was not yet completely solved. Every so often, the glider would still slip sideways during a turn and spin out of control. The fixed tail rudder they had added to their new machine didn't help. It was time for the Wright brothers' unique approach to problem solving. They argued. They fought. One brother would take one point, and one brother would take the other. And then, sometimes, they would switch sides. And they'd scream and shout just as hard in the other direction. Can you imagine walking by, and these men are unusual anyway. They're small, they're, they're Yankees, to use the local term. And to walk by and hear these two men dressed in coats and ties inside this shack screaming at each other about things that make absolutely no sense to anyone, at least not to the local people. Well, they could argue right to the bitter end, being assured that the other person wasn't terminally angry with them or something of that sort. It enabled them to really toss ideas back and forth and really function as an intellectual team. Together, the brothers solved the final piece of the puzzle. They hinged the tail rudder and linked it to the wing warping mechanism. Now, for the first time in history, man could glide through the air with control. It's a beautiful picture. Orville took it from the top of West Hill looking toward Kill Devil Hill. Will launched. He flew straight away to gain altitude and speed away from the hill. And he turned. And he said he knew at that instant, we have done it. The brothers made nearly 1,000 glides that year, twice flying over 600 feet. The challenge now would be to turn their glider into an airplane. <laughs> 